Russell. Hello. Are you there? I am. Are you there? I'm, I'm here. I see okay. George is there too, ready to go. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I uh, got to talk to uh, George a number of times at some of the big uh, uh, train shows, uh, mostly the uh, narrow gauge uh, convention. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, uh, every now and then, George will give uh, a call to uh, Mike and I at the at scale and say, uh, how come you haven't sold any blue Nami's here? And I'd say, well, George, I guess Mike and I aren't real good salesmen, but do I have a deal for you? So uh, I think for um, uh, all you guys that uh, like to uh, uh, right now operate the, a lay, layout uh, via your, your phone with an app, uh, George has a deal for you that I think you'll find Pretty neat and and very interesting. So, uh, thank you, George, for taking your time today, and I'll I'll let you uh, spellbind the crowd. Well, I'll do my best. I can't promise any spellbinding activities, but um, anyway, uh, welcome. Thanks for giving me some time here. Um, first off, for those of you who don't know me, my name is George Bogatuck. Um, I've been working at Soundtracks for about almost 16 years. I turned 16 in October. And uh, I don't feel like I've worked a day in my life yet. Um, because I've been basically being able to do things like talking to folks like yourselves, doing train shows, and then also spending time. Um, but part of my job is harassing Russ and other retailers around the country about, you know, making sure they're apprised of new information, uh, make sure they're inventorying stuff and, and handling their orders. Um, and so when he presented this opportunity, I jumped at it, even though it's Saturday afternoon and I've got my wife over in the lunchroom here at the office. Um, so we're out running around, figured I'd spend some time with you. Um, first thing I want to do is I want to come back to the back to the basics segment. Um, he did a great uh, description on what's actually happening on the rails. But if you want to dive a little bit deeper, uh, if you go to our YouTube channel, and search Soundtracks Webinar 4. And Webinar 4 will show you the actual nuts and bolts of the communication that's going on so that that way you can kind of feel a better for what the DCC packet actually is happening. Um, and then we have Webinar number 6, which dives into CVs and what a CV is, how to set it, how they're structured, and, and basically kind of dives into all the different nomenclature when it comes to DCC and programming and things like that. So there's a lot of great information. I encourage you guys to check it out, but youtube.com search soundtracks webinar, W E B I N A R number four and number six. And if any of you guys are, how shall I say, maybe not as well versed in using your command station um, right here behind me uh, to power my, my uh, trains here, I've got an NCE power cab. But if you're not familiar with how to use your particular system, Webinar 9 kind of does what the other manufacturers don't do, and that's give you a video demonstration on how to use it. Um, and that's MRC, uh, Digitrax, and NCE. So uh, be sure to check those out. Now, first off here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into the presentation I've got planned, and we'll kind of dive into it here. We're going to do a slideshow from the beginning. So... Um, everything you ever wanted to know about Blue Nami decoders. Uh, so first off, we're going to kind of dive a little bit into what it is, brief overview settings, um, and kind of some use of it. Um, operate steam and diesel. I'm not going to have as much of that right now, just because in the essence of time, I'm going to try to keep it brief and, and informative. And then I will open the floor to questions if you guys have any questions. Um, if you think of questions later, you can always email me. Uh, George B, that's G-E-O-R-G-E-B as in boy, at soundtracks.com. And I'll be happy to help answer any questions. Just remind me where uh, we started talking to each other, and then that way we can continue on any conversations I had. Um, so first off, the, the name Blue Nami, it's kind of a strange term. And if you look at the logo there, you can see that the B represents similar to the Bluetooth logo. Um, we didn't actually pay for the licensing to use the Bluetooth logo because we didn't feel that was a value added. 
Um, but the Blue Nami word is a combination of the word Tsunami, which is our flagship product line, and Bluetooth. So it's actually a Blue Nami, Bluetooth Tsunami. Um, the decoder at its heart is a Tsunami 2. So everything that we've done over the past several years with either videos, clinics, demonstrations, anything like that, talking about the Tsunami 2, the Blue Nami can actually do as well which at its heart is a DCC decoder. So you can actually run this locomotive on a DCC system without having to use the app or your phone. Um, then the app can be downloaded. It's a free app. You can download it right now while we're talking. Uh, you can download that to your smart device, whether it's an iPhone or an iPad, or if you're Android, uh, Android and Android tablets, um, and I've got examples of all of that here in front of me, and I'll kind of try to put them up in the screen here so you can kind of see and, and move along with what we're doing. But the Blue Nami itself is a DCC-based decoder. The Bluetooth connection uh, actually gives you a third option to be able to operate and run your trains. Um, and the third option basically is the Bluetooth. You have DCC, then you can actually run it in analog with a variable voltage power pack, but you're extremely limited on the functionality of a traditional DCC decoder. And then, of course, now the Bluetooth. Now, the cool thing about the Bluetooth is once you connect to the app, the decoder is strictly using the track for power. In other words, it's ignoring all the DCC commands and it's just using it for power because all of its commands are coming from the app. And this is the Android, whoops, it was. There's the Android version of the tablet or right there. And I'll turn off my background so you guys can see this when I start demonstrating. But this is the Android version of the app. And then here we have the, um, and of course the camera's not working with me, but the Apple version on, a, on the tablet. Um, but what that does is when the decoder is strictly using the track for power, that means that we can operate on a DC layout. Uh, we just turn the track power up to power up the decoder, make sure the process is running. So between 10, 12, 14 volts, somewhere around there, you connect to the app and your app basically takes the place of your DCC system. Um, basically, you're app now becomes your DCC system. So no longer do you have to go out and spend all that extra money to buy a system. And then if you want wireless, you have to go buy all these wireless throttles or anything like that. So you can use straight DC power to power the layout um, and operate your trains. The third option is, as shown there in the bullet point, is battery power. And what that means is that because it's DC power, you can do onboard battery. So this makes onboard battery a whole lot more affordable and attainable because especially in the larger scales, we have room for the big batteries. Um, you can put a battery in a tender of a locomotive, put the decoder in there and then connect everything to the uh, Blue Nami. And to kind of show that off, if you again, on our YouTube channel, we did a installation video I did for a local friend of mine here who was doing a large scale layout. And so we used his Aristocraft uh, C16 and did a full battery conversion on camera. So you'll be able to see that. Um, the other thing is that, like I said, if, if you have wireless throttles in your phones, that means that anybody that comes over to operate your trains now potentially has a throttle in their pocket because any, you know, almost everybody has one of these things in their pockets anymore. And so they can come in, download the app, connect to your trains and you're running. And I'll show you all the benefits once we get to that partition of that particular part. Um, one of the other things, and I want to explain the, the Bluetooth connection because the Bluetooth is actually, uh, you know, when most people hear Bluetooth, they think of their headphones. And if they're using head, wireless headphones that are Bluetooth, you usually have about a 30 foot range uh, or 10 meters, I think it is, um, before you start losing connection and the audio drops. Um, but this is using a slightly different protocol. This is using what's called Bluetooth Low Energy or BLE. And um, basically there's a different type of protocol in, in how it is. The decoder is still paired with the app. So once I connect to my particular device, I can't see that locomotive on any other device. So you don't have to worry about somebody sending multiple commands to your locomotive. 
like you can in DCC if everybody has the same address. Um, but the Bluetooth Low Energy, if anybody has one of those smart watches or anything like that, it's the exact same protocol. Uh, Fitbit, same thing. And the reason I point that out is because, number one, uh, we advertise a range of up to 100 feet. And there's obviously going to be factors, things like, you know, when you run through a screen wire uh, mesh mountain, for example, you might lose a few feet. Um, if you're running on a layout with aluminum framing around on the backdrops and you're on one side of the of the uh, uh wall and your locomotives on the other side, you may lose a few feet. Again, you're not going to have any drastic uh, drops. But the reason we use up to 100 feet is because we've actually taken it 144 feet before we lost connection. Again, if you go to our YouTube channel, search soundtracks and the word range, uh, you'll see the blue NAMI with a range test that we did outside our offices where I was measuring in parking lots and the parking or parking spots and the parking spots were about nine feet apart. And I went something like 15 parking spots before I lost connection. Um, it was something amazing. And, and you can see in the video live, I'm doing a double shot on my camera. I've got one camera pointing to me and one camera pointing to the other. And then we have a screenshot. Um, so with 150, 144 foot range, um, line of sight, no interference, you should have no problems in your normal operating conditions at either your home or club or in your uh, garden railroad or whatever. So that's why we use the phrase up to 100 feet. Um, the other thing is that, and this has come up over time, where people will say, well, it's wireless, and so therefore it's interfering with our radio throttles. And the answer is nope, nope, it's not. And here's why. Um, because in, in most DCC systems, for example, the command is constantly repeated so that if you lose power for a second and come back on, at least the command comes back to get your locomotive moving down the track. But with the Bluetooth, it only transmits the information once and then relies on your decoder to continue doing what it's doing until it's told to do something else. Um, and then that's when it'll transmit the next thing. So there's not a constant communication uh, back and forth between the decoders. And the other thing is the Bluetooth, uh, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy actually has 37 independent channels that the uh, app and the decoder are searching for, for to find the cleanest uh, communication. So if it starts broadcasting on one channel and there's interference, it immediately jumps to another channel and they communicate that way. So you don't have to worry about radio interference with your throttles or anything like that. Um, so the uh, app is actually made by a company called Blue Rail. We've partnered with them. They uh, are basically designing and working on the app. Um, the Apple was their first release. It was fully done, but now they're working on Android. Android is technically still a beta. Um, you can do everything you want to do with a single locomotive, and I'll get into that in just a moment. Um, you just don't have the ability to do consisting, and that's coming very soon because this particular version of the app right here that I've downloaded on this tablet actually has the beta version of consisting that I've been playing with for the last week, trying to break it and trying to find problems. So hopefully that'll be finished up here in the next week, few weeks and, and released publicly. And that is worth its weight in gold when it comes to running your locomotives. I'm going to show you how to do all that here in just a moment. Um, now, the app is really cool because it gives you access to everything. So if you see the picture up there on the far right, um, when it comes to a tra traditional DCC system, you have to remember function 10 does this, function 12 does this, function 5 does this, function you know, 23 does that. And you have to remember that. Then there's the added complexity of looking at your throttle here and saying, well, wait a minute. How do I access function 23? And it's not immediately intuitive because you have 10 buttons, 0 through 9. And how do I access function 23? Well, on the NCE, you're actually going to push and hold the shift and the 0 key. And then up in the screen there, you see, I think it should, there it goes. Uh, you see function 10 through function 19. And that's telling you the 0 key is, is 10, the 1 is 11, the 2 is 12, the 5 is 15, and so on. But if I want to access function 23, I have to push and hold the shift and the zero a second time. And now you can see that it says 20 through 28. And the same thing, the zero is 20, the one is 21, the two is 22 and so forth. So it's not necessarily easy or intuitive, but then you have to remember um, 
But the, the benefit of the app is that all of your functions, as you can see there, are labeled. So when it comes to the sander valve, for example, um, I don't have to remember that it's function 21. I can just look at the list and see sander valve, and I push the button. And these are all changeable. So you can change them as you see fit. The same thing with the lights. You can see there that it says FX3, FX4, FX5. I can change that and rename that. So I don't need to remember, for example, that the function 24, and I'm going to show you these locomotives I have here on my screen. I mean, right in front of me here. Hopefully this will come through on, the, on there. But there at the bottom, of course, it's blocking that out. Tell you what, give me a second. Let me fix this. Hmm. Here we go. Um, none. Now you're going to see my dirty office. <laughs> but here in the app, you can see that I have my functions labeled. So strobe lights, you can see they're labeled. My red markers are labeled, and then uh, my number boards and truck lights are labeled. So you can see that I don't have to remember what those functions are. Everything's just visible right there in the app. Um, and so every and so I can use the functions as I see fit. So you can see that I've got my headlight, air horn, uh, my brake application and my train brakes are on. And then I've got my direction switch down there on the bottom. And then the big green knob is my throttle direction. So everything's accessible right there. Um, now, this is just for operations. And I can run multiple locomotives. So when I look at this, there's a little arrow right here on the side. I click that. And I'm doing this by looking. And I can go back and forth to different locomotives. This one's consistent. I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But I can cycle through all these different locomotives that I have, or I can go to what's called multi-train, where I can see multiple throttles up to three on my screen, and I can cycle through. So basically, the app will talk to however many locomotives you can keep track of, because it's not constantly sending communication back and forth. It's just sending it when it needs. So you can have 37, 40, 50 locomotives on your app connected, and you can go through and cycle and talk to each one independently. Um, so that kind of covers the operation. Now, when it comes to the actual use or setup of the decoder, Blue Nami really shines in this case because now no longer do you have to remember, does anybody know what CV adjusts volume, for example? No, you don't, probably not right off the top of your head. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this other device over here, and hopefully I can hold this up enough that you can see it. But down here, I'm going to push this gear button right there, and it's settings. There we go. And this is where I make all my adjustments. So I can come over here to sound settings. And if I want to adjust my master volume, I just click that. And there's my master volume. It's a slider bar. I can move it up or down as needed, uh, or I can type in a number, whichever I know what the value I like is. I can make all my adjustments there. Um, when it comes to selecting the sounds, for example, um, in this case, if I wanted to change the air horn, I can just come down here to my air horn. I'm going to scroll this up a little bit. And I click air horn, and there's the list of all my air horns. I don't have to remember that CV120 to a value of 23 is my Leslie RS3L. I can just scroll. Whoops, wrong, wrong thing. Hold on. There we go. That's what happens when I'm doing it through the camera on the phone on the screen, and I'm about that big on my screen. Um, but all my all my horns are listed, so I can scroll through the list of my horns, and I can keep scrolling until I find that K5, or I'm sorry, the uh, RS3L. There it is, right there. So I can just click it, and now the app is taking care of the settings behind the scenes for me. I don't have to remember. CV120, and I don't have to go in and do all that looking up. The app does all the work for you behind the scenes. And this is where you can make all of your settings. You can adjust the volume of the air horn. You can adjust each individual volume. So as I scroll through here, I can select the bell. I can select the air compressor type. And I just work through the list, and everything's there. I don't need to do CVs. Um, now, if you want to do CVs, for example, there's a setting here for CV settings. So I'm going to click CV settings. 
And there's a button up there at the top that says read all CVs. Now, if any of you guys are familiar with a program called Decoder Pro, um, this may take 15 minutes or so because it's still relying on that DCC protocol. But because this Bluetooth chip on our decoder is connected directly to the processor, I can transmit that information a thousand times faster than DCC. So when I push this button, read all CVs, and it's done. I've just read everything in that decoder, all 500 plus CVs. And so it did it in 5.3 seconds. And so that kind of gives you an idea of just how fast that communication is. Um, and part of the other thing, the, the reason I love this uh, aspect too, is because there's been times where we've been to some of the major train shows around the country. And there's one somewhere in the Midwest, and I'll leave it at that, um, that we visited that, you know, there's a, I mean, it's a club. It's in a former bowling alley down below a grocery store. And they have a lot of tracks, but that means they also have a lot of trains. And what happened was one time years ago, we were giving a clinic presentation at their, at their club. We took it out and put it on the layout. And the guy who was doing it on the layout, because of course I didn't want to, I was letting them play with it. He went to blow the horn and he pushed the button on the throttle. Honk. It took three seconds for that honk to play when he pressed the button on the throttle. You know what that told me? How much DCC traffic do they have in that DCC communication bus that took three seconds for that command to actually get sent out? Um, and that's one of the downsides of DCC, especially if you have a large club, is because you can have more trains. And more trains means, of course, more traffic. And more club members means more DCC traffic, uh, more commands, more locomotives, things like that. And then the other added benefit is, and I'm not going to throw any particular system under the bus, but if you unplug the system and don't properly clear your throttle, your throttle still has that command stuck in the command queue for the DCC system, even if that command is sit still, turn all your functions off. So what happens in today's world with a lot of our mass produced models, we bring them to the club because that's where we can run the five, six, seven locomotive consists. And, you know, let's say somebody, everybody models, the, you know, New York Central or BNSF or whatever, they buy all those models. So they have the same type of club members owning the same models. So, you know, we'll throw Russ under the bus because he's here. So Russ comes into the club and he puts his locomotives on the track. Now his locomotives are starting and stopping, starting and stopping. Well, then he starts thinking, well, what's wrong with this decoder? Actually, nothing, because the decoder's only doing what it's told to do. And so that command that's stuck in the queue telling his system to, or telling his decoder to stop is conflicting with his active throttle that's telling it to go. So the decoder's doing the commands as soon as it's being told. So that's one of the challenges that can come up with DCC. And that's why you can't have more than one locomotive on the layout with the same address. So when it gets into these mass produced models uh, where everybody has the same locomotive numbers, everybody has to say, well, let's say um, right here in front of me, I've got this Pittsburgh Lake Erie uh, Bachman switcher 8663. Well, let's say three of us have that same model. Well, one of us gets to use 8663. One of us is probably going to use 63. The other one may use 86 or 66, whatever it is. And so you're kind of limiting on that. But with the Bluetooth, it doesn't matter because once the Bluetooth is paired with your device, you don't have to worry about it. And so you can give your locomotive a nickname. So in this case, up here at the top, you can see this one says uh, ST Milwaukee Road 18. And that stands for Soundtracks, my Milwaukee Road 18. So this is the what I've got on my desk here. So that's this Milwaukee Road right here. And that way, if let's say we have a few of us have the same locomotive, we can put our initials with it or some other identifier in the name. So when it pulls up on another device, it shows ST Milwaukee Road 18. So I know that's the soundtracks one. Don't click that one. Find your Milwaukee Road 18 or whatever it is. And so this is where the Blue Nami really shines because the pairing is there. And as I mentioned, it works on traditional DC power as well. So we don't have to worry about um, you know, having to hook up a throttle or anything like that. You just power the track up and your locomotive powers up and all your app runs through there. Now, one of the other things I hear 
um, a lot of times is where people will say, well, I want the feel of a throttle. I want the th feel of a knob. Well, there's a button under here that I don't know how well you can see it there. It says tactile throttle. Um, and when, when I click that, what it does is every time I move my throttle up or down, it buzzes my, th my, my device. It'll buzz the device so that I can feel that I'm moving the throttle. So I don't have to look at it when I'm moving the throttle. I know I'm moving it because I have that tactile throttle on so I can feel that I'm actually moving the throttle. Um, so, but ultimately, if you want the knob, you get you can still use your DCC throttle. If you still want to use this to run your trains, great. Use the app, do all your settings, make all your adjustments, set up the locomotive the way you want it to run, and then use the app or use the uh, throttle to actually operate it. And the good news is, is you don't have to go and convert your entire fleet because if you have like, say, you know, right here on my table, again, I'm going to show my messy office here, but I've got this pair of F40 PHs that I just finished doing last night. And I've got them consisted together, but let's, for argument's sake, say I put the Blue Nami in this one and DCC in this one. Well, the good news is I can still run it with my DCC throttle. I don't have to use the app. Once I, I put it on the track, just turn your, leave your app disconnected and run your train with your DCC throttle. Once you connect to the app, the decoder will follow app commands, whether it's mine or somebody else's, once I release it until I cycle power again and reset it basically to set it back to um, uh, DCC mode. And so that way you can pass it on to other folks in your operating session. They just open up their throttle, open up their phone, download the app and start running the trains. So, um, and again, this works exactly the same way on DCC, whether you're using a DC power supply or onboard battery. The decoder and the app function exactly the same way, so you don't have to change it up. And it, does ma it doesn't matter. The app itself uh, is going to vary, but whether it's on an Apple or an Android device, the decoder itself does not care. It's just looking for that proper Bluetooth connection and the protocol, which is the communication from the app to the decoder to tell it what to do. And that's how the apps differ is the Apple generates it differently than, say, the Android. And once that signal is generated and sent to the decoder, the decoder just follows the command. So I can release it off of one and run it with another. The other thing, you don't have to worry about having multiple people with multiple throttles. I'm sitting here right now, as I've kind of alluded to, I've got three separate devices running trains on my, four, my little four foot piece of track here. So I've got my personal cell phone here running my pair of F40 PHs. I've got my Apple iPad running my uh, Milwaukee Road 18, and then I've got the Android app here running the uh, uh, Pittsburgh Lake Erie uh, S4. So you can have any number of devices working in the same area because all of that is being paired, so I don't have to worry about communication. And with 37 channels and your instant communication, you don't usually have to worry about a channel lag or delay because if you had 37 people lined up in a row, and all of them were going to blow the horn. And you say three, two, one. And all of you blow the horn. All 37 of those horns are going to blow at the same time. Guy number 38 will have to wait for half a second for one of those channels to free up and then his will blow. So you get a much faster communication and response based on using the decoders uh, with the app. Um, let's see. I wanted to, let's go back to one more. So here at the bottom, this is where I wanted to talk about. So when it comes to multiple locomotives, you can operate them from a single device. As I've mentioned, you can run up to however many you can keep track of. But when it comes to the Blue Nami app, this is where it really shines is because of consisting. And I'm going to use my personal phone here just because I've been operating with these uh while I was waiting for my time here, I just installed them. So I was setting them up last night. So I'm going to show you how to do this real time. So I just disconnected my decoders. So here next to me, and again, I'm going to show you this and ignore the messy desk. I've got number 289 here in the lead and number 200 is my trailing. And so what I'm going to do is with my app, and I'm going to try to hide as much of this dirty crap, uh, messy office as I can.
But what I'm going to do is down here, you see where there's a chain link down right there. So I'm going to click that. And each device has up to four consists of any number of locomotives you can run in that consist. So in this case, I'm going to choose consist C for Charlie for whatever reason. Now I can put any number of locomotives into consist C as I can, as I want. I can put five locomotives. I can put 10 locomotives. I can put 25 locomotives if I really want to. So we can see here at the top locomotive 289, the first locomotive I click will be my con will be my lead consist. So I'm going to cycle over here. Now I'm on Amtrak number 200 and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go ahead and push the consist. And when I push C, you can see my throttle disappears because it knows the other locomotive is the lead. So I'm going to change. So I have two questions. Is this a middle loco or a rear loco? I'm going to make sure it's a rear and then facing forward or facing rearward or backwards. There, the app's done. It's done all the work for you. Now, when I run my locomotives, and I'm going to open up over here, and I don't, I don't expect you guys to be able to hear this because the audio doesn't always come through on this, no matter what I click. But when I blow the horn, the lead unit's blowing the horn, but when I set my brakes and I turn up my throttle, they're not moving because my brakes are set. So I release the brakes... And you see the, the well, there you go. Now you can see the locomotives are actually moving. And then when I apply the brakes, oops, causing accidents here. When I set the brakes there, they then both come to a stop together. And then I can change direction, run my throttle up, release my brakes. And what the DAP does, let's go ahead and bring those to a stop. And then we'll go ahead and mute them again. Now, what the app does is it intelligently sends the commands to the respective locomotive based on its position in the consist. So as you would expect, the lead locomotive is going to display your headlight, your uh, ditch lights, your uh, uh, strobes or anything else like that that would be uh, accessible on the lead unit. The trailing unit would then not get the horn and bell and lights, but it would get the uh, brake commands. So that way all of your locomotives behave together as if they're a single locomotive or a single group of locomotives, just like you would in the real world. So this way, when you run your trains, you don't have to, you know, I, I talk to people all the time. They'll either set them all to the same address and then run them. And what happens is every locomotive has their headlight on. And it's, and it, you guys decide, and I say you guys, meaning modelers in general will say, well, I, I understand what I did. I'll live with the lights being on on all units. Um, and so you just run them that way. And then they're always inevitably running elephant style because you don't know necessarily because then you have to go into the CV settings to change the direction of the locomotive based on its position. Um, and the app does all that work for you. So in this case, it's sending a command to the lead unit uh, locomotive 289, move forward, speed step 10, turn on F0, turn on F1, turn on F4. Uh, F4, which is our dynamic brake, F1 is our bell, and F0 is my headlight. But to the trailing unit, it says locomotive 200, move reverse, speed step 10, turn on F4, which is my dynamic brake, which would be on on all the individual locomotives. So the app intelligently does that, and you can go through and make your own settings. So again here, when I get to my app, there's a thing here called consist settings. Whoops, I want to talk about that in a second. Consist settings. And this is where I tell the, the, the app which functions I want sent to which locomotive. So I can go through here and I can just say on my lead locomotive, for example, we've got bell, horn, dynamic brakes, and then and so forth. Whoops, wrong button. Then when I go to my middle, you can see that my, uh, my bell, my air horn, short horn, but my dynamic brakes are active. You can see that. And this is where you would go through and do that. So it makes consisting much more easy and fun. And it's a click of a button. So when I want to drop, let's say I'm dropping 200. Well, first off, hold on. Let me back up. When I'm running my trains, let's say I do a turn. Okay, I'm out going out to the industry and then coming back. There's a button right there. It says make lead. Hopefully that comes through. So what I do is I push the make lead button. Now my throttle appears. Now locomotive 200 is my lead unit. 
And when I go to my locomotive 289, you see my throttle's gone because it's a rear unit facing backwards. The app intelligently does all that work for you behind the scenes. Whereas if we were doing that with um, DCC, for example, to do it properly, we would then basically be building an advanced consist. An advanced consist uses CV19 for the consist address or alias, and then CVs 21, 22, 245, 246, and 247 to tell the decoder which functions to respond to when it's part of that consist. And if you want to see details on that, watch webinar 14. But the Blue Nami app allows you to do all that through the app. And then, like I said, I can drop a locomotive. So let's say I'm dropping helpers. I just simply uncheck the C uh, on my uh, consist. And you can see that now locomotive two, uh, 289 is back to an independent locomotive. And when I go back to 200, you can see it's still the lead consist C. So I didn't destroy the consist. But now the app intelligently sends those commands to the appropriate locomotive. So you can see it's still consisted. And that to me is really worth its weight in gold when it comes to operating your trains, because now you get to use all those features and sounds that we've been talking about with the Tsunami 2 for years. Because, I mean, let's face it, we're closet wannabe engineers, which is part of why we want to do this instead of just making scenes and stuff like that. We like running our trains, presumably. And this gives us the ability to more accurately run our trains. And so that's where the Blue Nami really shines. So I really encourage you guys to take a look at it. Um, try it out. Like I said, you don't have to convert everything right away. You can start putting one or two locomotives uh, in with a Blue Nami, run them with the Blue Nami app. And then if you want to run them with other trains, go back to your DCC system and operate them. You don't lose anything uh, for that. Um, so apparently this screen needs to be updated. But the Blue Nami has four different formats, three of which are listed here. We have our Blue 2200, which is this universal style up here, hardwire, uh, two amps, six functions, two watt amplifier. MSRP is $169.95. So they are about $30 to $35 price here or higher than the Tsunami 2 Cousins. And you're, for that $30, $35, you're paying for the added hardware because you can see the Bluetooth chip right here. Uh, hopefully you can see my mouse, but the Bluetooth chip is right here. You can see it here uh, on the decoder, and that's what's actually communicating to the app. Um, so you're paying a few extra dollars for that added hardware, and then a couple of dollars for each purchase goes towards app development. Um, then we have our 4-amp decoder, which is good for O-scale and larger. It's a 4-amp decoder, th eight light outputs, 3-watt amplifier, so it's nice and loud. MSRP is $255. This is about $50 higher than the Tsunami 2 Cousin. But like I said, you don't lose anything. Then we have our Blue PNP, which is good for HO diesels. Uh, a lot of these circuit boards will be uh, replacing the uh, light board that's inside the model. Two amp output, eight, or two amp for the motor, eight light outputs, two watt amplifier. And then the one not pictured is our 21 pin, which is what's actually in these Amtrak engines on my desk. And it retails at $169.95. And it does have eight functions and uh, all the standard 21 pin plugs right into 21 pin. So conversion to Blue Nami is quick and easy. So that's basically what I've got prepared for you. Um, I'll open the floor if you guys have any questions, anything like that that you want to ask. Well, I always have questions, George. <laughs> well, you're welcome to fire away. And this is a great forum for it. <laughs> well, one of the things in, uh, uh, you know, it's still working great, but I still have a, a uh, uh, iPhone 8S or 8 <laughs> Plus, right? <laughs> so, um you, you know, soon that probably is going to have to be uh, upgraded. But I guess the, the, the question is, if you have m maybe even a, an older, uh, either a Mac or a Android operating system, uh, you know, the, the app that you've just been showing, uh, can that phone handle that? Yes, it'll go back to an iPhone 6. Um, and I'm not sure on the Android stuff. Uh, it needs Bluetooth 4.0. Um, so you should be able to find out if that's on your device, uh, looking at the specs. If not, you can go to the Blue Rail website, which is bluerailtrains.com. Excuse me. And on their website, they have a, a whole list, a whole list of uh, 
devices that'll work with it, as well as uh, troubleshooting tips and hints for the communication. Okay, and then right. and then on your on your Amtrak uh, units there that you're showing, mm -hmm. did did blow, blah, blah, both of them have a blue Nami in it? Correct. Okay. You so have to have the blue Nami. Right. So in other words, if by any chance, like you were saying uh, earlier in the presentation, that if one of the units had the blue Nami, the other one had a tsunami mm -hmm. or an eco Nami, mm -hmm. you couldn't do, uh, in other words, you couldn't tell it to, to break, only the blue Nami would break correct or well what will happen is because the bluetooth the app is only talking to the blue nami it can't talk to the economy or the tsunami too because as you can kind of see here the uh um bluetooth chip is hard built onto the decoder so there's no right. way for that decoder to communicate then to the economy or tsunami twos in tow so at that point you would run your train using your dcc system just the same way you have with every other thing you've run Okay, so in other words, and, and again, so if um, if you had the, uh, the the power cab or the pro cab that uh, and, and one had a tsunami, one had a blue nami, then they would both run just mm -hmm. say like, a, okay, just on your DCC system, just like a tsunami too. you don't lose anything. So you still have full DCC functionality. The Blue Nami has all the same great features the Tsunami 2 has, just now with the added benefit of being able to access it with the Bluetooth module that talks to the app. And the app basically gives you that ability now to have a, a and I'm going to use this phrase, accurate dialogue with the decoder back and forth. Um, one of the things, and I get um, people want to challenge me on this, but if they had to deal with some of the phone calls we do on a regular basis, um, you'd have the same opinion, but Decoder Pro is great until it doesn't work. And <laughs> I'm not saying if, I'm saying when, because we don't actually write the Decoder Pro software. Right, That's right. written by a bunch of volunteers and they do a great job, don't get me wrong. But where I have the problem with it is that too many people rely on it as a substitute for the manual. And so they think the checkboxes and slider bars are gonna give them every ounce of information they ever need for the decoder. and yeah. If I had a dollar for every time that uh, uh, somebody would call up and say, hey, I'm trying to get XYZ feature to work and I'm using Decoder Pro, I wouldn't be here this weekend. I'd be taking a vacation somewhere um, because it happens every day. No, and, I'm sure. and so it's like I said, people think I hate the program and it's not that I hate the program. I think it works, but too many people rely on it as gospel. Um, for example, there's a... Um, uh, uh, discussion group in the groups I O on the soundtracks name. Now, don't tell anybody, but I secretly lurk there and I watch and monitor it. They haven't quite figured out that half the time the con the content that they're asking questions quickly become a YouTube video in the following week. But my point being is that somebody will come on there and say, "Hey, I want to implement the Tsunami Two functional braking. How do I do that? What CVs do I adjust?" Inevitably, there's one guy that always pops on there and says, well, I don't have any idea what CVs to use. I use Decoder Pro. What did you add to the conversation? That's just a comment. What did you add to the conversation? Nothing. But what he wanted to do was put his chest out. Yep, I use Decoder Pro. Look at me. And it's great. But then I've had to help him figure out stuff because the Decoder Pro software didn't work quite right. Yeah. And well, so you, you and I have talked about that mm -hmm. before, that that. Uh... Uh, again, uh, every time, um, you know, you guys or any of the competitors come out with something new, then uh, it's no longer a valid program on the Decoder Pro. And, and they have to. And, and I have found that a, a number of times that if it read your decoder, sometimes it will say like, well, is it a is it a tsunami one, tsunami two? And it's like, well, I don't know. You're supposed to be. <laughs> So, yeah. Well, I, I will. I will tell you, we have regular communication, and I mean, whenever they know something new, they call us up and say, "Hey, can we get the the CV default sheet?" Yep, here it is. That's the extent of our communication. But they're pretty quick with it. Uh, for example, when Athern releases a new, I don't know, I'm making it up, a new P42, for example. Um, 
once it's released in the world, somebody will call him up and say, hey, I don't have this stuff for the P42. He'll inevitably call us up. Hey, do you have those CV defaults? They're shipping. Yep, here they are. And email. And they have them. So within a week, they're usually pretty responsive. And we're pretty responsive to them. But like I said, their Decoder Pro is not a re replacement. And so the only reason I point that out is because when, when we're doing this app with the software developers at the Blue Rail Trains, I was harping on them to make sure everything worked properly because I don't want to have somebody calling me up because the app didn't work the way the decoder works. I want them to call me up because they can't find that particular setting or they don't really understand how the setting works, but I don't want them calling me up because the setting didn't work. And I can tell you, um, actually, Norman, who's our primary tech support, had somebody call him up uh, this week because they were using Decoder Pro. But somewhere in the saved profile, they had CB8 as a value of eight. So every time the customer wrote the Decoder Pro software to the decoder, it yep. would load reset, everything up. Reset it. But then they have a current keeper, which means they pick it up off the Decoder Pro programming track, put it on their main line. The decoder hasn't cycled power yet. So that CB8 is sitting there waiting as a landmine. And I mean landmine, meaning it's not going to blow up the decoder, but it's going to reset the decoder. So he runs his train. Everything runs fine. Turns his layout, goes to, uh, turns his layout off, goes to bed, gets up the next morning, turns the layout on. <laughs> the decoder starts flashing the lights at you as a reset code. He's like, what's wrong with the decoder? Absolutely nothing. There was a hidden thing that he didn't know how to find that was setting CB8 to 8. And because his current keeper would keep the decoder alive from the time he picked it up off the programming track, and put it on the main line, the decoder never reset. So it was sitting there and it would run just fine all day long, two hour, three hour session, because that CV8 doesn't happen until you cycle the power to the processor. And then when power is restored, that boot up says, oh, reset all your, all your CVs. And then it goes and resets everything. And then we have that error code, the flashing light, of 16 times to let you know that the software reset or the CB reset has taken place and that your decoder is resetting. So it gives you that visual indication to let you know that it's happened. And that was what was happening with this particular customer because he was using Decoder Pro. But he was absolutely adamant it was the decoder. And we're like, I can't tell you how, I mean, you're welcome to send it in, but then I'm going to charge you to send it back because I'm going to say it reset just like I told you uh, yeah. over the phone. And so those are the things why I had, I, I, like I said, I don't mean to spend too much time on this, but that's why I have this hate love relationship with it. Um, I like it because there's so many cool things built into our decoders that really let us become the engineers. Like I said, I think most of us are closet wannabe engineers, even though some of us actually are. But um, I've never run a real train in my life, but it's so much fun running these. And so when you get in there and you actually use the braking, you use the you know, like, for example, and part of the reason I had these brought with me today was I was setting up head end power. And so when I've got two Amtrak engines paired together, one of them is called head end power, which uh, uh, ramps up the prime mover to notch eight so that the main generators as uh, supplying power for the passenger train, lights, air conditioning units, cooking things, all that stuff is being powered off of the main generator from the locomotive. But when two locomotives are consisted together, it's not the first locomotive that has HEP enabled. It's the second one because the engineers, when that locomotive is at notch eight, that engine is running rough. It's loud. It's shaking. And the engineers want a comfortable ride. So they turn on the HEP in, this, in the second unit. Well, and then I always tell the, I always ask the question, well, when there's HEP in three units, which one has the, uh, or, or when there's three units together, which one has the HEP? And most people say, well, the one next to the train, I'm like, wrong. It's actually the middle one. And the, and the question is why? Well, railroaders are lazy. And so if it was in the third unit, if there was an issue, they'd have to walk to two units to get to that third unit to address the issue. Whereas if it's a second unit, they can just walk one unit to get to it. And I can't take credit for that comment. That was actually done by a former, excuse me, a former Amtrak engineer told me that story. So I use it as a joke, but more to illustrate that these are the features that we build into the decoder that lets you as the operator run your trains as realistically as you want. Or if you just want to watch them run in circles and blow the horn, then you can do that too. But 
those are the features and what this Blue Nami app allows us to do is to get in there, use the features. And that's the same thing with Dakota Pro is the, 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 the users can get in there and play with the settings. And while they may run into issues, and that's why we're a phone call away if people have questions, and we're more than happy to help, by the way, we don't necessarily completely trash the Dakota Pro software. It's like, okay, we'll stop using Dakota Pro for a moment. Let's set the CVs the way I'm telling you to do it, set it directly. Then you can always read back into the Dakota Pro and find out what changed. And you may find out that you misread their explanation or their explanation was flat out wrong. One of the two is going to happen. Um, but that's where the, I love all this stuff because it gives you the ability to get in there and use the decoder. Um, there's so many things built in there. I could do, we do a, or we used to do anyway, and Russ, I think you're familiar with this. We used to do a two or three day class uh, for the retailers to come over here and learn as much as we can in two or three days and then send you out uh, so that you can be the go-to in your area uh, for information about the decoders. And we don't cover everything in those two to three days. Yeah. Yeah. George, George, one more quick question and then sure. I'll open it up for anybody else. But you're saying if you want to go in and replace, uh, you know, I can't tell on the screen, but the but the uh, Blue Nami 2200, does that have a harness or. Mm -hmm. OK, so in other words, if you had a if you had the, the equivalent uh, tsunami, you could just unplug and then plug in your your yep. uh, Blue Nami then. Huh? As a matter of fact. Uh oh, matter of fact. This Milwaukee Road 18 right here, um, I didn't change the harness. We just used the factory harness there. Hopefully, you guys can see that. Um, a little but, bit of reflection. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to uh, eliminate here. Let's do this. Hopefully, this will be a little better. Um, trying to find out where that light's coming from. But anyway, um, this is using the factory harness right here on their factory circuit board. And so the circuit board, and we just plugged into the blue 2200. And so basically I just have to attach the speaker wires and the, uh, this has a current keeper in it here. Um, well, a couple of stay alive capacitors, but um, I just attach the speakers and we've got two speakers wired in parallel. I'm sorry, series. Um, and then we just plugged into the nine wire harness. So that's all you have to do if you have these nine wire harness. And this is the Walther's version of these uh, E8s or E7s or whatever. Okay. Um, all right. Well, great. All right. Fantastic. So any other questions, anything else? And and like I said, I'm also a phone call or an email away. If you have any questions, you can reach me at George B at soundtracks.com. It's basically my first name and, and initial for my last name uh, at soundtracks.com because trying to get you guys to spell Bogotuck would be all, I wouldn't get half my emails probably. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and my apologies. I didn't spit that out quite right with oh. the introduction. So I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> well, honestly, the original pronunciation from what I've heard, I found a Ukrainian gal that I was at a restaurant I was, I went to and I asked her, I was like, wait, you're Ukrainian. How would you say this? And she says, Bogotuk. So I was like, okay. And the funny thing is my dad and my brother both or and his brother both pronounce it differently. My dad was Bogotuk, which is his Americanized version, but his brother pronounces it Bogatiak. So <laughs> I, I as long as as long as I know you're talking to me, I'm good. Yeah, yeah. All George. Right. Hey George. Yes. Quick question. Um when do you expect the uh not the Apple, but the uh, Android version to be out public. Uh, well, you can download it right now and do everything you can't want to do with a single locomotive. Uh, consisting, I'm hoping, will be done in a couple of weeks. Um, because, like I said, I've, I've been playing with it on this particular device here uh, for a while now, for about a week or so. And they're trying to finish up some last minute things. Um, and then the last thing they have to do to that would be speed matching. Um, which I didn't cover is actually in the uh, Apple version where you have multiple locomotives together. If you go to multi-screen, um, if you go to multi-screen, there's a button down there that says speed matching. And what I can do at that point is just slightly adjust the throttle command so they work more perfectly together. That particular method of speed matching does not change the CV settings in the decoder. And so... I personally don't care for it um, because if I need to do any of that, I'll do it through the CV. So that way I don't care which device I grab, whether it's this one or this one, 
or this one, they're going to work the same way and they're going to work together. Um, and so that's just my personal take. But the Android app version right now, you can download, start playing with it. Uh, consisting should be, like I said, in a few weeks. Um, I'm hoping one to two, but I, I mean, I was also promised consisting before the uh, Denver tra Rocky Mountain train show in April. So I hesitate to give you a date, but the fact that I've been working with it and been happy with it, um, they want, I, they need them to fix one or two little minor things I found and hopefully that'll take care of the issue. Okay. Thanks. Hey, mm -hmm. and, and George, George, that is, that is Mike from, from scale there that you've talked about. Okay. To. Yeah. Perfect. I heard somebody else had a question. Yeah. Do y'all have an end scale decoder or? Are you working on one? Um, not at. Well, I don't have it at this moment in time. Um, I don't know how active the the project is, but it's something that's on the radar. Um, at first, it'll start with an eleven hundred, um, which, if you really want to look at it, TSU eleven hundred is about the size, about that small, so it fits inside most N scale models. The challenge is the Bluetooth chip's about that size as my pinky nail. And so what happens is now we're talking about a decoder that's pretty populated now trying to add another piece of that big because you can see it on these large on these larger decoders. It takes up a pretty good footprint, which is very close to not necessarily extending, but very close to the same width. So it's going to be a it's going to be a challenge. Um, the good news was the 21 pin, which, like I said, unfortunately, I don't have pictured here, but the 21 pin is, again, it's another one that had to retain its same footprint. So we had to go back to the drawing board and, and find some new parts, things like that. So we're using some smaller parts on the 11, on the, the uh, um, 21 pin version to make it fit. Because if I grow that footprint at all, it's no longer 21 pin compliant. So that was the challenge and that opened the door for the ability for something on 1100. But I have no idea how active or what our time frame is, but it is on the radar. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? Mr. Darcy Elliott. Yeah, George, is this going to come into any, uh, any of the OEMs going to pick this up? Do you have any actor going to pick this up anytime soon or anything like that? Um, short answer is right now, the only one that has done anything is um, PBL. Uh, and they did it in their 288 or 2662, I think it was, their light logging in SN3. Um, but as far as the others, Athern or anybody else, they've all interested, but not one of them has actually pulled the trigger because it does add cost. Um, because that that price differential between the um, the bear decoder for Tsunami 2 versus the Blue Nami is that's as bare minimum as we can make it. Um, because, like I said, there's hardware differences and there's uh, uh, app development money going towards it. So. Uh, they've kind of been balking a little bit. So I can say voice of customer speaks volumes. I can only sell it to them for so much. But if you as the customer continue to start, for lack of a better term, bombarding these manufacturers saying this Blue Nami is the greatest thing. What the hell? Why aren't you buying this? Because like I mentioned early on, it's a DC operable system. So um, I know there's a couple of people out there that are still DC, including Eric Bruman of the Utah Belt. I'm sure you guys have seen that layout. He still runs an analog block control, which is fine, but he just hit the jackpot because now he doesn't have to do anything to his system. He can still run his trains, but now he gets all the benefits of DCC. And part of the reason I've heard from friends of why he never upgraded was because he's always staying modern. And so every time a new locomotive comes out, like the SD70 ACEs, he retires all his SD40s and buys SD70 ACEs. So if he was adding decoders to all of those every time he upgraded, that would be a huge amount of cost. But the Blue Nami, with all those sounds built pre-programmed into the decoder and you select them just with menus, it opens that door up. But now he gets the full operations without having to convert his system over. Um, and so... I, like I said, to me, it's a no-brainer for OEM, but, you know, honestly, uh, and I hate, and, and again, don't, I'm, I'm one of you guys, don't, don't take this the wrong way, but model railroaders are notoriously cheap. And what I mean by that is when... What? <laughs> <laughs> hey, trust me, like I said, I'm throwing myself in that also. But when um, Athern went from a 299 MSRP to a 310, you should have seen the, the amount of rage online that came up from them just going $10. But the fact is overseas manufacturing is continually going up. 
And so what are they at now? About a three twenty or three thirty dollar uh, MSRP. And but now you add thirty dollars onto that, so now you've got a three hundred and sixty dollar MSRP for their Athern Genesis to get the Blue Nami, and that's where they're afraid of. That's why, honestly where they're. Uh, balking a little bit. So all I can say is voice of customer speaks loudly. They're looking at it. They're interested. Um, but they're, they're humming and hawing about the cost. Yeah. Well, you know, George, I always say it as, as humans were, uh, gullible or whatever. It's like, we'll buy something for 1995, but for 20 bucks, no, no. Right. <laughs> and, 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 and again, we'll, We'll drive someplace uh, 90 minutes, but an hour and a half, forget it. Right. Well, think of this. You'll drive uh, 40 minutes out of the way to save five cents on a gallon of gas. Yeah, there you go. There so, you go. And so, that's just well, true of all of it. So. You know, a lot of, uh, from time to time, a lot of customers come in the store and say, uh, like if it's a, a steam locomotive, why didn't they uh, blacken the, you know, the pilot uh, wheels. And it's like, well, because that would have jumped it up maybe another dime, another 15 cents. And you would have said, that's too expensive. I ain't well, going to do it. Well, and then the other thing, you have to look at mass produced models because they're building 3000 of these things. So that dime may not seem like much, but that may add, let's see, 10 cents or all of that. You're probably adding, you know, three, four hundred dollars or three, yeah, about three hundred dollars to the cost of the production. Sure, no, no, I, I get and it. And it adds up really quickly. And then it's a dime here, a dime there, uh, a dime here. And like I said, in this case, it's thirty dollars roughly for decoder. And they wouldn't be able to mark that up with a percentage um, because now you're talking, you know, it'd be a forty-five or a fifty-dollar price difference. So that's kind of where, like I said, that's kind of where they're balking. But the good news is, is that they are available in the different formats. And most of the manufacturers, including Broadway Limited, which I was really excited to see, are now offering non-sound uh, versions of their models. So you can get the 21-pin Blue Nami, plug it in, and, and go to town, and you're good to go. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. It's silence here, George. All right. Well, like I said, if you if you have any questions, email me, George B. at Soundtracks. Maybe you don't want to ask him in a public forum. That's fine. Um, I totally understand it. Um, but I will tell you, ask your questions because that's how you learn. None of us were born knowing how to do all this stuff. At one point, we had to learn how to build bench work. We had to learn how to wire our layout. We had to learn how to lay track. We had to learn how to build a tree. All of this is how you learn. So don't hesitate. Please ask your questions. We are here to help you because, you know, and I say this, it sounds very cheesy, but I swear, you know, Scout's Honor, it is the absolute 100 truth. Um, when I was growing up, I started this hobby at about the age of 14. Um, and I had a great group of guys from the, my local hobby store that took me under their wing and taught me a lot of this stuff and allowed me to be able to enjoy this hobby so, as much as I do. And so while I am paid to sell you decoders, I do enjoy doing this kind of stuff. That's why I said I'm volunteering my time here this weekend because I can come out here and share how much fun I enjoy using these decoders and all the cool things we built into it with you as fellow model railroaders. And I can answer your questions because your questions are pertinent to how you learn how to do all of this stuff. So again, don't hesitate. Please call me, email me whatever uh me or norman both of us have grown up in the hobby and we're, we're both more than willing to sit down take the time answer your questions don't be afraid of asking a dumb question there's no such thing because that question helps you learn and and guys and then georgia thank thank you for your for your time and thank your uh, wife for giving you a kitchen pass today and uh and and yep. guys, uh, I I will say not because you're here, George, but of all the different companies um, that uh, you know you call for information, uh, George and uh, Norm have been really first class, and like I said, they'll they'll take the time and and really uh, hold your hand through it. Where uh, uh, some of the other ones are like, uh, well, you dumb. You dumb, don't, don't you know better than that? Uh, geez, oh, geez, you should give up railroading him. So, so <laughs> George, thank, thank you very much uh, for your time today. And, and, and again, thank your, 
wife for letting you talk to us. Yep, no worries. And then I just want to add one last thing. Made in USA. Our decoders are made downstairs from where I'm sitting right now. Other decoder manufacturers can't say that. And that's part of the reason why they own the bulk share of the OEM market is because the companies uh, that use that particular brand of decoders don't have to deal with the added or added challenges of exporting to then re-import. Um, and that's why we lost a lot of our accounts was because manufacturing overseas became a lot easier for them because they just receive a finished product. And in a lot of cases, it was in the same building or down the street delivery. So uh, lead times and things like that. But we do manufacture here. So you are supporting USA built company uh, and products. Well, there you go. <clears throat> and if anybody comes to Durango, you're welcome to come visit for a tour. All right. <clears throat> and with that, I will bid you guys adieu, let you guys finish up. Have a great Saturday, a great rest of the weekend. And thanks for letting me come in and talk to you guys. Yeah. Th thanks again, George. We really appreciate it. <clears throat> Thank you for your time. Yep. Thank you, guys. Okay, gentlemen, ladies. Me too. Uh, and you and Rob.